Hello, and welcome to Central Booking, where writers and readers are the authority. I'm your host, John Valeri. Today on Central Booking, I'm talking felonies and food with award-winning author Leslie Butowitz. Leslie writes the Spice Shop Mysteries, the seventh of which, Between a Walk and a Dead Place, was published earlier this summer. The Seattle Chinatown International District's Year of the Rabbit celebration comes to a sobering end for businesswoman and amateur sleuth Pepper Reese when she happens upon the scene of a crime. Her friend Roxanne has just discovered a dead body in a basement room of the long-shuttered Gold Rush Hotel. And not only is the victim's identity a mystery, but so too is the decades-old herbal pharmacy in which he was killed. Will looking into the past allow Pepper to serve up some justice? Or will she find that murder remains on the menu? A native of Montana, Leslie graduated from Seattle University and Notre Dame Law School. She practiced civil litigation and employment in criminal law for many years before turning to a career in crime fiction. Leslie is the recipient of three Agatha Awards, including Best First Novel for Death Al Dente, the inaugural title in her venerable Food Lover's Village Mysteries. As Alicia Beckman, she writes moody suspense that includes the standalone books Bitterroot Lake and Blind Faith. Between a Walk and a Dead Place is decidedly more cozy and recently sold out its first print run. Library Journal noted the inclusion of Chinatown's history along with the stories of the culture and residents as a depth seldom found in cozy mysteries. Now, Leslie Butowitz makes a case for variety being the spice of life and literature. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Central Booking. Today, I am in conversation with award-winning author Leslie Gulitz. Her new book, Between a Walk and a Dead Place, is out right now for your reading pleasure. It is the seventh in the Spice Shop Mysteries, and it just went into another printing. So congratulations on that, Leslie, and welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a delight to be here with I'm so happy to have you here. I feel like our worlds have been circling online for a very long time, and now here we are, finally, in sort of virtual real time. Uh, and I just have to say, before we get into this, this was actually my introduction to this series, even though it's several books in, and I have to say that I was so impressed, you know, with how you melded backstory, but also the many, many components to this book, because not only is it a whodunit, but I kept thinking you get, you know, business, you get culture, you get history, you get food, you get medicine, you get even more than that. I mean, it's just, it's sort of a melting pot of elements and so much to savor and enjoy. Uh, so thank you for that reading experience. And I figure for people who have not yet read this book, which is probably many people tuning in, let's give them, you know, a bit of a starting point. So of course, as this book begins, your protagonist, Pepper Reese, wonderful name, uh, she is at a Lunar New Year celebration. And of course, whenever a mystery opens with a celebration, things turn really, really quickly. And so she actually is, she comes upon not only a mysterious victim of murder, but also sort of a mysterious setting in the Gold Rush Hotel that nobody knew about. So I'm wondering if you can talk about these two elements and how they draw her into the mystery of one, needing to know who this person is that is dead, but also the mystery surrounding a room in this building that nobody really knew existed. That's a great question, a, a great place to start. Pepper, of course, owns the Spice Shop, which is in Pike Place Market in Seattle, and that is a very real place place I fell in love with as a college freshman and have loved ever since. And that was quite a while ago. Um, I made it my mission to eat my way through the place and I will never be done because it's always changing. So that's a great thing. Truth be told, I did not know a whole lot about uh, uh, Seattle's Chinatown uh, when I lived in the city. Uh, and so I got to learn a lot more about it by, by writing this book. And I know you want to talk a little bit more about the history later, but I want to mention that because yes. Pepper and I are learning about it in at the same time, and the reader is too. Pepper is born and raised in Seattle. Um, she's 43, I think, when this book starts. And she admits she doesn't know that part of the city, which is just south of downtown, as well as she knows other areas. And so when she is at this Lunar New Year Festival with her parents who are uh, home for a short time visiting from Costa Rica and her good friend Sita, they they get waylaid, they get misplaced on their way to uh, a particular performance that they wanna go see. 
And on the way, they find themselves in an alley and they see some blinking lights and they think that's kind of strange, but they don't really think anything more about it at the time. Um, it becomes very important later, of course. And then they're in front of the building and a woman comes rushing out of the building. It turns out to be a woman Pepper knows. And uh, this woman, Roxanne Davidson, is an assistant curator at the Seattle Art Museum, a place I do know quite well. Uh, actually at the Asian Art Museum up on Capitol Hill. And she sees Pepper and immediately asks her for help because she says she's found a body in the basement. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about what is in the basement, but I will say that it is a mystery. And um, it's not just the mystery of, of who who the dead body is. And I should mention that, and this is not a spoiler, he's dressed as a lion dancer. And of course, lion dancers are a major feature at uh, the Lunar New Year and in, in the parades and other festivals. So Pepper and Roxanne don't know who this man is, but Pepper is going to be content to let her friends at the Seattle Police Department work out who he is and solve the murder. That's what they do. Uh, she knows them well after seven books. She's more intrigued by this building, which she's walked by. She has a customer uh, of her spice shop a few doors down. And she's seen this place, but she's never really known what, what goes on inside. Why is this an old residential hotel that looks like it's still being maintained, even though no one is living in it? Why is it still there? Why is it not being used? Why is it closed up? What's the mystery of, and I will say it's a Chinese pharmacy in, in the basement. What's the mystery of that? And Pepper gets involved because she wants to help Roxanne, who is cataloging the contents of the building for the owners. She wants to help Roxanne figure out the mystery uh, behind this, this Chinese pharmacy from the 1920s and 30s. And so that's what pulls her in. Of course, ultimately she does get pulled into the murder mystery as well. And she figures out who the dead man is before our friends, detectives Spencer and Tracy. And yes, they've heard the jokes and no, they're not amused. Detectives who investigate homicide are rarely amused. Uh, and so that's what pulls her in, but then it becomes a, a bigger, a bigger story. Sure. So a double mystery right off the bat, which I love because I'm a sucker for any mystery, but when you get two, you know, for the price of one, winning. Um, and so I wanted to, to follow up. You actually, you mentioned that obviously you're familiar with Seattle, but you said you and your character are sort of both learning Chinatown. And I wanted to ask you about that because what is your process like to really try to grasp and understand the history and the culture of a people other than your own in the most authentic way that you can present it, especially when we have so many conversations today, you know, about appropriation and misrepresentation. I mean, you really dig in here and I, I'm a believer. I can imagine, you know, what your process was like to capture that essence. Can you talk about bringing that to the page in a very authentic way? Sure. So I'll start by telling you where the idea came from yes. and how I how I created the Gold Rush Hotel. A few years ago, my husband and I were in Seattle and we went to a place called the Wing Luke Museum, which is a museum of the Asian experience in the Pacific Northwest. Wing Luke was the first Chinese uh, person of Chinese ancestry on the Seattle City Council in the early 1960s. And this, this museum is in the Kong Yik building, which is an old building on Jackson Street in Seattle. And um, it's got a, a permanent rotating exhibit devoted to Bruce Lee, who is an icon in Seattle uh, and an icon in our household because my husband is a martial artist and uh, is devoted to, to Bruce, as most uh, uh, martial artists are, especially those who like the movies the way he does. And so we, we toured that and we toured the other parts of the museum. And then we went on a guided tour of an adjacent building, the Kong Yik East building, which was a um, community center and boarding house of sorts for Chinese laborers built in the 1880s. 
And of course, the Chinese laborers were essential to the economy of Seattle and the Northwest because of the railroads, but also because of the canneries. In those days, um, fisher boats brought the fish back to port where they were canned. Nowadays, they're canned mostly at sea. Um, but the cannery workers were typically immigrants, many of them Chinese, and they lived in these large Chinese-owned boarding houses. Now, of course, we have a long history of, um, well, I, I will will say that we're going through this, this closed residential hotel, and I'm finding it just fascinating. And I started to think, what if there was a body? What if there was a body in the basement? And that's what led me to create the gold rush on what was, when I last saw it, a vacant lot in uh, the CID, as it's called, the Chinatown International District. Uh, and so I started kind of letting that, I let it sit in my head for a few years. Uh, at that point, when we made that trip, I think I had two of the Spice Shop series uh, written. And I knew that while the heart of them is the market, I also wanted to take readers to other parts of the city when I could. And so that's why I wanted to write one set in the CID. And I needed to wait until I got uh, in story time to the Lunar New Year because that was the best time to set to set a mystery there. As you say, whenever there's a celebration at the beginning, we know something's going to go wrong. And so I certainly wanted to take advantage of the richness and the culture that's so visible um, at, at the Lunar New Year. So when I started thinking about this, uh, I had some of those same questions that, that you ask about uh, appropriation. Obviously, I am, as Pepper describes herself, a standard issue white woman. Uh, she says she's a pinch over 40. I'm a pinch over a pinch over 40. Uh, but that's all right. And I started thinking, how, how would I handle that? Well, by keeping the focus on her and on her discoveries and never pretending to know the perspective from inside the community, but always keeping it Pepper asking questions, Pepper wanting to learn more about the community. She happens to know a prominent Chinese family, the Locks, quite well, because one of the younger generation of Locks works for her in the market. And his father is an acupuncturist with a clinic in the market. Uh, there is, in fact, one there. I, I don't actually know that particular acupuncturist, but there is also an acupuncture clinic in my house because my husband is an acupuncturist. And so I, I knew a few things about the uh, about the practice of, of Eastern medicine through him. And then of course we bring in the older generation of, of locks as well. Um, and so by keeping the focus on Pepper, I, I thought that I was, was introducing people to an important part of, of Northwest history without pretending to be part of it myself. Sure. So I can talk about how I actually did the research, if you're interested in that. Yeah, if you want to. And let me just say too, sure. what, a, what an sure. excellent entry point for her character, because you know she is constantly being sort of self-referential and aware of the fact that she is sort of an outsider, but she wants to learn, she wants to know. And so, you know, peppering people with questions, if you'll Pardon the expression, um, but yeah, please do tell us a little bit more about the, the actual research that you did. So I could not go back to Seattle to do the research, although I did go back last fall shortly after I'd turned the book in and was able to walk the streets again and make sure that I, I knew where everything was. Uh, but at that point, the, the book was pretty much uh, uh, written. We were in the editing phase. I could have fixed any mistakes, but, but the story had pretty much already been told. So I did a lot of the research through websites and through reading. Um, I am a great devotee of the market sketchbook. And I have to tell people about this because this book was created by an architect in the late 1960s and 70s when the market itself was under uh, threat of, of being uh, demolished and redeveloped. This architect created this sketchbook walking around the market and drawing what he saw. And it became a huge a hugely important part of, of saving the market. 
and I refer to that over and over again. I mentioned the Wing Luke Museum. I spend a lot of time on its website, a lot of time on the websites for uh, two preserved Chinese pharmacies in the Northwest, one in rural Oregon and one in Butte, Montana. And, and I have, have been to that one. Uh, but I also discovered a couple of, of uh, collections of oral histories that the Wing Luke had uh, put together with people from the Chinese community who had lived in the CID in the early decades of the 20th century. And that was really fascinating. Then I discovered a book called Building Tradition, Pan-Asian Seattle and Life in the Residential Hotels. And that sounds like it would be really dry, but it's not. It was just really, really fascinating. Uh, the, the author, Professor Marie Rose Wong, actually teaches at Seattle University where I went, but um, I, I have not yet met her. Uh, but it was a really interesting book and it tied in so well with everything else I had done. I wanna mention two other things. Um, one is that while I was doing this reading, we went on a little vacation and we were staying in a historic hotel that was in uh, North Central Montana uh, in a little town called Fort Benton. And it was built in 1882. Well, that is just about exactly the right time period for the Kong Yik and my fictional gold rush. And so walking around that old building and seeing the warped window sills and the porcelain doorknobs and the push button electricity, the hallways and the hallway and the stairway, as you know, do become important in the story at the end. And just imagining myself there in that kind of time period uh, was really, really interesting. So that, of course, was a guest hotel. Professor Wong wrote about the residential hotels, and the Kong Yik was a uh, uh, sort of a boarding house. I kind of melded all those three together. I want to mention one other reference because it, it helped me a lot to make sure I was tying everything together well, and that is a book called Long Way Home, Journeys of a Chinese Montanan by Flora Wong. And Flora Wong's daughter, one of her daughters, is a good friend of ours. And uh, so I had met Flora uh, and we'd had this book, which uh, this copy is signed to my husband, uh, who's known the family even longer than I have. And uh, it, it's been in my house for years, but I hadn't read it. Well, just as I was wrapping up writing it, I decided, well, I should read Flora's book. Flora uh, was born in the United States went back to China with her family when she was a little girl right around 1931. And as you know, 1931 is the key year to the backstory uh, of the Chinese community in Seattle. And then returned to Montana as a, uh, not a mail order bride, but pretty darn close in 1948. And so it's a different time period a little bit and a different place. She's over here instead of Seattle. But what that helped me understand was so much about the conditions in China at the time that brought people here in the 20s and 30s, and then again in the 40s, and what those, those ties were that went back and forth. And without giving away too much, as you know, John, that, that ends up being very important in, in the story. So a lot of reading, a lot of uh, visualizing, and a lot of uh, looking for the ways that things could come together. And I think you've just disavowed any of the notion that just because something is fiction, you can make it up because it has to be authentic, you know, realistic fiction in a book such as this. And it's just incredible how all of those things kind of interweave. And I think we just got some small idea of, you know, what the process is like that feeds into a book. Um, like well, this. So me... may I comment on one thing there? You said that uh, just because it's fiction, you can't make it up. And that's absolutely true. It has to feel real. And it won't unless you've done your research. Now, I will say I am not aware of any uh, preserved or any extant uh, Chinese pharmacies in Seattle. And I've asked around. Uh, no one at the Wing Loop was aware of one. There's a professor in Southern California who has written extensively about uh, the practice of Eastern medicine in the United States, and she's not aware of any. 
Um, so it's possible that there is one, but I, I think that people might feel, oh, the gold rush actually exists and there is this preserved pharmacy. And I sure hope they do feel that way. I just don't want them to go actually walking around looking for it. <laughs> well, now I know better because I would have believed that it was an actual place in discovery. Uh, so actually to, to sort of piggyback on that, let me just ask you more generally uh, about setting because you tend to write about places that you know intimately, whether it's Seattle, Montana, you know, you've had feet on the ground in those places. Can you talk about, you know, how place enhances plot for you and why it's important for you to write about places that you have actually, you know, viscerally experienced? Mm -hmm. um, when I saw that, that question on your list of things we might talk about, I thought, oh, that's an astute observation that maybe I hadn't even made myself, with the exception of a couple of stories set in Greece where I have visited, and they're both set in places I have visited. Um, Pretty much everything is is set in a, a place that I do know quite well. Uh, Bitterroot Lake, my first standalone novel, uh, is written in a completely made up or set in a completely made up town um, and lake, but um, it could be real. It's it's certainly set in Northwest Montana with with the history and the the uh, uh, life and economy that we have here. Um, I am most interested in writing stories that could only happen in that particular place. I am fascinated by place. Uh, it's, it's, I'm deeply rooted in, in Montana. And I, I don't want to write a story that could happen just anywhere. Now, it's certainly true that I, you could take uh, the basic structure of Between a Walk and a Dead Place and put it in another city with a, a strong uh, Chinese uh, heritage and histories, say San Francisco or Vancouver or New York. Uh, but the story then would change too. Because if you think about the Chinatown in San Francisco, its history is different. Its physical appearance is very different. It's got a very Asian appearance, unlike uh, Chinatown in Seattle. And that's deliberate in Seattle. Um, and, and so, and, and that, that difference in appearance is part of the reason why the gold rush uh, uh, falls beneath the radar for so many people. They don't really realize it's there. I want to write a story that is deeply, intimately connected to the place because that's what interests me. Sure. And I think as a reader, I love that. You know, I know that some people will fight to the death that, you know, setting cannot be its own character, but I heartily disagree with that. I love you know, when the characters and the place sort of have interaction and it just, I think, makes it a much richer tapestry. And I really did feel reading this book, you know, that it had to take place there because it was, I don't know, I just felt very, very into it. Uh, so it worked really well. But I want to ask you too, you know, something I really enjoyed and that I bet, you know, your returning readers love is of course the mystery, but also, you know, the insights that you get into Pepper is a businesswoman, is an entrepreneur, um, because so much of the book too is about her job and, you know, how she runs her business, how she interacts with her employees and her customers. And so you sort of have to become kind of an expert on that as well, so that your book has that element of realism. So can you talk about, you know, your process of sort of internalizing what it would be like to be in Pepper's shoes as that business person, as that entrepreneur, to add a whole other, you know, sort of texture uh, that continues on throughout the series from book to book. So I did not grow up in a foodie family. Uh, I learned about food later. And one way that I learned about it was by walking through the market where there are uh, now two, but but back then was just one well-known spice shop, Market Spice. When you walk into the market, many people will be able to picture this. You walk down Pike Street and there's the Pike Place Fish Market where the men and women in their big uh, orange and brown rubber aprons throw fish back and forth and sing and entertain the crowd. Well, just off to the left of that, down a little hallway, is Market Spice. And when I was a college kid and went to, to the market, and then later after law school as a young adult working downtown when I went to the market, which I did regularly, a couple times a week, <coughs> excuse me, um, 
I always went into the spice shop to get a little sample cup of spice tea, which is something that that uh, I gave to Pepper Shop as well. And I started to smell the the spices and the herbs and hear people talking about it. And I just got really fascinated. Years later, when I decided to write a second series in addition to my Food Lovers Village series, I knew I wanted to set it in Seattle. And with an urban setting in a cozy, you need a community within a community. That meant the market. And so I knew right away I wanted a spice shop because to me, the spice shop was the cornerstone of, of Pike Place Market. And there's a second one called World Spice, which is down on, on um, the lower level on, on Western Avenue. And the uh, owners and staff there have been just tremendously helpful to me in learning more about spices. Um, if I were to turn the laptop around and show you my, my desk, you would see I've got several books on spices. And it's just something that's really been, been great to learn about. When I first started writing Cozy Mysteries, both the food, first the Food Lovers Village Mysteries and then this series, I knew I wanted to write a foodie or a culinary cozy because they're fun. I enjoy reading them and because readers love them. But, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I am not a trained chef unless you count watching Julia Child videos. And I, I've never worked in a restaurant, so I couldn't I couldn't use the restaurant or, or catering setting. But I did work in a bookstore as a teenager and uh, in high school and college. And so I knew a few things about retail. And obviously it's changed a lot in the 40 years since then. But I have a lot of friends who run retail businesses, particularly here in, in my small town, which is the model for the Food Lovers Village. And so I pay attention. When I go to a bookstore to do a signing or when I go, when I'm shopping, I'm listening. Uh, and my friends who run the spice shops have told me stories. Friends who, who run story uh, shops here have told me stories. Uh, people in the market have been enormously helpful. Uh, there are a couple of people I know who work there, a, a jeweler and a coffee shop owner slash tour guide who have answered questions for me, sat down with a cup of coffee and, and uh, just talked to me about working there. And uh, so, you know, when I'm listening to these stories, I'm thinking, how can I use that? What what might happen? Um, the creative process involves being open to putting together all kinds of different things and creating something new that hasn't happened before, but feels like it could. So that's that's how that comes together for me. Sure. Well, I have to say I loved it. I found myself as invested, you know, in everything that was going on at the spice shop in the warehouse, you know as well as the mystery. And I think that for a series like this that's gone on for a long time, your returning readers are as invested in the personal and professional life outside of the investigative aspects. Um, yeah. So I feel like if I had a business, I would probably be a better boss simply for having <laughs> read this book and, you know, walked with Piper, uh, Pepper, I apologize for a bit. Um, but I really, really liked that. And I also wanted to expand on something that you mentioned in your answer. You talked about community. And in reading this book, and I think the acknowledgement section of this book, uh, you do bring up both community and passion. And I see those as sort of being two of the underpinnings you know, of this story in particular, and probably of the other stories that you've written as well. So I'm just wondering if you can talk about those two things for a moment and how you like to incorporate those into the stories that you tell. Sure. I believe that the essential defining feature of the cozy mystery is community. Uh, a crime happens, it disrupts the social order of the community, whether it's in a small town or whether it's in a, a defined community within a community in a, in a larger city. And so we have the official investigation by the police or sheriffs or whoever it is by, by law enforcement. And their goal is to identify the killer and bring that person into the justice system. Then we have our amateur slew who is personally affected by the crime. And that's that's the reason why she gets involved. She has what what my friend and uh, editor, the late Ramona Long, referred to as the VGR, the very good reason to get involved. 
she's she's got to have that and she does because something has affected her personally or people she knows or or this community around her and so she investigates and of course she wants to bring the person, the killer, to justice. But she is also interested in the impact that crime has had on the larger world. She wants to resolve that rupture in the social order that the crime has caused. Uh, and so I think that that's, that's her drive, but it's also part of our drive as, as readers. We wanna see this group of people work together. We wanna see Pepper and Sandra, her assistant manager, who is based on a close friend of mine, uh, back from my bookstore days. Uh, we want to see them solve a problem in the, in the shop. We want to see how Pepper deals with a personnel problem. Pepper has a, a had a previous career in uh, human resources. We want to see how she deals with conflicts between people in the market, which is one of the subplots in uh, Walk, there's a, a problem uh, over parking and vehicle traffic in the market. And Pepper gets involved with that. We like seeing those communities in action because we thrive on community and depend on it. And so it's just really satisfying, I think, to see a community come together to work, to make something work and to, to make uh, uh, justice happen. Um, you mentioned passion. Obviously, I have a passion for the cozy mystery. Um, I think it is a, a much broader canvas than some readers and critics give it credit for. You can do an awful lot with the cozy mystery. Yes, there are some confines. Um, Pepper's swearing is limited to I swore under my breath or oh, parsley poop. Um, there are some other restrictions, you know, no blood and gore on the page, but that's all right. I don't want to write it. Um, and yet there's so much that you can do in this canvas. You can bring in social issues. And I do. I do in most of the books. Um, this is the first one to really have a lot of historical content to it. Uh, but readers really seem to be enjoying that, and, and I'm glad. Uh, you mentioned passion in particular in connection with this book because one of the personal uh, issues for Pepper is she's feeling a little bit at, at sea, and that's kind of a pun because part of it is that her boyfriend is a commercial fisherman and, and he's away, and she is feeling his absence and wondering, was well, there something else she should be doing with her life? And, uh, you know, she's not gonna take a, a, a needlework or mm. a photography or um, any other of the, the many passions that there are because her passion is in fact her work and the spice and her community. And so it was great fun to help her kind of realize that. Sure. That was fun to read, too, because throughout the book, and this is not a spoiler either, but she keeps thinking that she needs to find, you know, a hobby, something else to occupy her time. And I just kept thinking, she's so busy, you know, with a business and investigation and personal relationships. I'm like, why would she possibly want to bite into anything else? But, you know, she had her uh, moments of reckoning. Uh, so we've been talking a lot about uh, the sense of community that exists within these books and in cozies in particular. And I think that that's very, very true. But I want to ask you about the, the sense of community in sort of a broader scope as well, because within the crime fiction community, there is an incredibly generous, you know, tribe of like-minded people, whether it's authors, readers, um, both. And I'm wondering if you can speak to that. And also, you know, given your experiences in the community, what guidance would you give to people who are maybe looking to make connections with other readers or writers and just don't know, you know, how to do that? Because there is a community for you out there and it is expansive. <laughs> there certainly is. And I'm glad you brought that up because uh, that is is near and, and dear to my heart. And I would not be published had I not found uh, uh, a writing community. I found Sisters in Crime and Mystery Writers of America very early when I started. In those days, just as the internet was getting started, 
uh, we all had trouble finding information. Now the problem is too much information and sorting our way through it. Uh, but a community is essential in both ways. And I really do want to encourage anyone interested in writing to find a writing community, preferably in person because there's nothing quite like sitting with a group of people over coffee or whatever and talking about books and talking about the business and learning about the craft. Maybe ultimately you need both. Um, I am the last original member of the Duppies, which is the Sisters in Crime chapter for new and unpublished authors. Uh, fortunately, you don't get kicked out when you get published. Um, you're, you're asked to, to stick around and, and uh, share and continue learning. Uh, is one of a handful of primarily online chapters in the 60 plus chapters of, of Sisters in Crime. And of course, I have to talk about SYNC because I am a former president of the national organization, and it's kind of like a lifetime contract that I have to talk about the organization. There is no better writing community around, really, if you write mysteries. Uh, and uh, SYNC also has published a couple of books for mystery writers. One is called, um, hmm, hmm, I can see the book, I can't read the title, but the newer one is called, oh, Rites of Passage, Rites, W-R-I-T-E-S, and it's it's a collection of essays by uh, Sisters in Crime members on the writing line. The newest one is Promophobia, Taking the Mystery Out of Promoting Crime Fiction, that came out last year, and it is also an excellent collection of, of ideas from uh, members across the mystery spectrum on promoting work. Right behind me, you might be able to see the red spine of the Mystery Writers of America handbook on writing. And this is the new one that came out in 2021. And it's just an essential reference for anyone who, who wants to write. But it also emphasizes the importance of community through, through uh, writing group chapters. I just really think that that's an essential part. Um, you will learn so much more. You will feel less alone. Writing has to happen alone, ultimately. But every opportunity I've had has come as a result of, of the community. Absolutely. Excellent resources. And so you mentioned Sisters in Crime, which is a terrific organization. Uh, and Connecticut actually has a newer chapter in Phenomenal. Yes. And I have to tell you, um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is the fact that Pepper in her shop carries culinary oh. mysteries um, and she will make, you know, recommendations. She will share those books. And last week for the first time in person, I met Karina Moss, who is a Connecticut author. She writes the Cheese Shop Mysteries, you know, and again, we've had sort of a relationship online, but we hadn't met in person until last week. And then I was reading your book over the weekend and one of the shout outs is for Karina Moss and her book, Cheddar Off Dead. So I'm just wondering, you know, if you can talk about the books that you like to recommend in this series. And then, you know, if there are books that you really enjoy uh, that you would encourage your readers to pick up if they enjoy your fiction, you know, maybe they'll enjoy that book as well, even if they don't get a mention in this series because they're not foodie mysteries. Well, it's, it's really kind of fun for me to slip in a few references to uh, foodie mysteries and to cookbooks that relate to the theme. And Karina's Cheese Shop series and uh, Daryl Wood Gerber's Cheese Shop series written as Avery Ames both get a shout out because there is a new cheese shop in the market. And uh, I need to mention uh, that a very generous reader named Sandy Lynn Seacrest bought name, character naming rights at the auction to benefit a, a local literacy organization at Malice Domestic, uh, the convention celebrating the traditional mystery. And she is from Wisconsin and she wanted to run a cheese shop in the market. And so she got her cheese shop. And so naturally I mentioned a couple of, of books that related to cheese and also some cookbooks. Um, I love throwing in uh, either cookbooks I know or that I've I've been hearing about uh, that would be on the shelves in the bookstore. And so uh, sometimes I uh, 
try to to make a, a thematic connection. But the other books that get mentioned are medieval mysteries, because very early on in the series, Pepper surprised me by finding a box of video cassette tapes that her parents had left in, in her storage locker. And she's crawling around in there one night looking for something and she finds these tapes and they're the Brother Cadfile series. And Brother Cadfile uh, becomes uh, her spirit guide. She reads, she sees the, the movies, but she also reads the books. And I love the books, they're over on that shelf. And uh, I love bringing in Brother Cadfile. Well, eventually she does finish reading him. And so there are references to, to a few others. Margaret Fraser's Dame Favise series, uh, Jerry Westerson's Crispin uh, guest series and a couple of others. So it's it's just fun to think about what might my, my characters read because I wouldn't trust a character who didn't read, right? I, just I like we don't that. trust characters who don't eat. <laughs> um, what am I recommending these days? I will tell you three books I've been recommending uh, in in each of the subgenres that I, I particularly love. My favorite cozy so far this year has been The Golden Spoon by Jessa Maxwell. It is a debut novel and it is set at a bake-off in a um, an old estate in I think Vermont. And it is uh, the rare standalone cozy. At least I think it is a standalone. I'm pretty sure it is. I don't see how it couldn't not be. Uh, and I have not heard uh, about a sequel. That's The Golden Spoon. My favorite historical mystery that I've read so far this year is Anywhere You Run by uh, Wanda Morris. It came out in 21 or 2. 22, I think. Yeah. Uh, it is set in Jackson, Mississippi in 1964 with uh, two young Black women who are sisters who get caught up in um, some really scary stuff. But it's it, it's not a scary, scary book. It's not horror. It's it's historical mystery. And it, it's really extremely well done and just it just captivated me. And um, my favorite suspense novel of the year so far is was... Um, uh, one by One by Ruth Ware, set in the French Alps. And I think that was a 2020 book. And I read it shortly after we took a hiking trip to the Swiss Alps. So it was kind of fun to be able to, to picture. The YTBR pile just grew a bit. I will say I did read the Wanda Morris book and it was outstanding. Uh, I should mention to people too, you get recipes in this book and there's a great one for I think it's apple cheddar scones and I was telling my wife I might have to make that because I think that maybe that's within my capabilities I don't know it's possible it doesn't it seem terribly difficult they're really good they're really good and they're not difficult and they're cheesy and appley and just really terrific and in Connecticut you'll have great apples very shortly right yeah absolutely and I figure if I'm going to eat an apple I might as well have it with cheese it just seems like some things go better together. Um, I am going to move away from Pepper in a minute because I just want to ask you a couple of general questions so people get a sense of your background, but I don't want to keep you here all night. I'm doing a good job of that. You know, it'll be tomorrow pretty soon, but I did want to ask you, you know, about writing a series because you sort of, you know, have the challenge of welcoming new readers who aren't familiar with what you've set up in previous books, but you also want to maintain some narrative momentum so that you don't lose the readers who've been with you for the first, you know, six books coming into book yeah. seven. So I'm wondering, what is your approach to that? Have you found that there are keys to delivering backstory in a way that doesn't bog things down so that readers, regardless of whether they're old or new, you know, so sort of had a, a good entry point? I think the most important thing is that you want to be able to establish who the character is, uh, who the main character is, and yet at the same time, many people already know her. And so you need to show the day-to-day -day routine, but in a way that maybe you haven't shown it before. So we've always got the Wednesday morning staff meeting. Well, this time it's a little different because something different happens. I want to show what goes on in the market without saying the same things over and over. And so I try to highlight a different element of it. Um, bring in different people from, from um, Pepper's own personal life. Um, the first five or six books of the series, each one focused on a different person in Pepper's inner circle. Uh, so the first one 
we're meeting her friends, the Flick Chicks, the, the movie group that she meets with. We're meeting her staff. We don't even meet her family in that first book. Uh, we meet her ex-husband because he is a Seattle police officer on the, the bike patrol. And that's actually kind of an interesting dynamic. And I, I, I want Tag to be in um, every book, but he has a bigger role in some than in others. Um, he doesn't have a real big one in, in this book. And, and so, you know, relationships change over time. How does theirs change? And so I focus on how their relationship changes. Sure. I and think I that's, think, that's the heart of it. Right. And I have to say, you know, as a newbie to the series, seven books in, I found this incredibly easy, you know, to fall into. I think you did a beautiful job with that. The hardest part for me was just keeping the name straight at the beginning of the book. But even that, you know, you get this... <laughs> Nice list of characters. So, you know, there's your setup. Um, so I referred to that a couple of times, but it was beautifully done. Um, so I mentioned your background, and I do want to ask you about this because you have a background in law, not only civilly, but criminally. And some of my favorite writers tend to be, you know, lawyers who have come to novels or, you know, recovering lawyers who've left that profession behind and decided that they wanted to concentrate in a fictional realm. So I'm wondering if you can tell us what compelled you, you know, to make the transition to fiction, to novels, and then how do you find that your background in law influences your approach to story? And not just, you know, how you set up crime and procedure and investigation, but maybe also more pragmatic things like just about discipline and telling the best story that you can. Well, I can tell you that um, killing people on the page is a lot more fun than anything else I've ever done. <laughs> it's my first favorite job of, of any job I've had. Uh, but I am very grateful for that long legal career for, for a lot of reasons, not least of which is the discipline of, of work and writing. I keep business hours, you know. Um, my writing business opens at 8.30, pretty much the way the law firm did. Some days, especially these days, I might not actually start writing until 9, but usually it's it's 8.30 and I spend the morning on the page and then in the afternoon uh, focus on business and promotion. Sometimes there's an exception. Right now I'm busily editing next year's Spice Shop book. And so um, it's easier for me if I spend a lot of time, a longer time doing that. But a couple of weeks ago, I wasn't writing at all because I was focused on getting a uh, walk out into the world. So you do have to be a little bit flexible. The discipline of, of sitting down to write is, is really important. Telling stories, um, for a different purpose than than the stories you you write uh, and tell as a lawyer. Uh, on the page, of course, you need shorter sentences. That's kind of a joke, but um, not really. Learning to write uh, a little bit different style uh, was a bit of a challenge. Probably not as much for me as for some other people because I was already reading so much. Right. But as you can see, I am perfectly capable of stringing together a really long sentence. <laughs> Hopefully it's, they all make sense. And I always appreciate it. But it's interesting because, you know, in the law, you are sort of beholden to the facts, unless you're a defense attorney, and then you have a bit more <laughs> latitude. Um, but I would imagine, you know, it can be very liberating to write fiction where there are indeed some things that you can, you know, make up, or as Marsha Clark you know, likes to say in fiction, she can control the outcome, which is nice because in real life, you like to think that justice will prevail. Unfortunately, it doesn't always happen, but then there are novels is a, is a pretty nice fallback. Um, and I think it sounds odd, but I think, you know, being an attorney is sort of a good training ground for a novelist in many ways, um, as you mentioned. So yeah, but, I think it is. And, and another way in which it is, is that we are used to learning new things. And so um, I learn a new aspect of business or life in, in every book I write. Also, uh, we do have some business experience and that makes it a little bit easier to understand the publishing business. Um, I also think having worked as a bookseller when I was much younger um, is helpful too, even though the business has changed a tremendous amount since then. And we didn't have touring authors then either, uh, or at least not in Billings, Montana. Uh, so I didn't get to see that aspect, but 
um, I know the book business from that side a little bit, and that's that's been helpful too. Yeah, I would imagine because I mean it is ultimately a business, and I think that sometimes you know people forget that it's not just writing the story. It's okay, the story's done, and now the work really begins because you have to go out and and sell it. So I think it's great to have that background and understand that there's a lot more to work to be done. You know, after the book has been you know written and bound, it's it's almost like you begin again, and then it's just a different aspect of the work. Um, but let me ask you briefly too. Uh, you mentioned, you know, that you write another cozy series under your Budowitz name, which is the Food Lovers Village Mysteries. But you also write what you call moody suspense um, under the pen name Alicia Beckman. So would you mind just giving us a brief primer, you know, on that book for people who are caught up maybe on the Spice Shop Mysteries, but want to read some more from you? What can they expect from those series and or standalones? Sure. So the Food Lovers Village Mysteries are set in a lakeside resort community on the road to Glacier National Park in northwestern Montana. Guess where I live? Uh, my main character runs a specialty local foods market in the heart of the village in her family's 100-plus-year-old grocery building, uh, Murphy's Mercantile, which was founded in 1910. And her name is Erin Murphy. As you can tell by that name, she's half Italian. Um, and so, you know, there's the humor and the jokes and the food, the same as in the Spice Shop Mysteries, but it's your classic small town setting. And it is also the classic setting in that uh, uh, here's a young woman who left her hometown and came back. She didn't come back under a cloud. She left under a cloud, but uh, not not really, not exactly. Um, but she she left and then she she came back to help her mother run this business. And of course, we've got the mother-daughter clash right there. And uh, family businesses are, are ripe for, for clashes. Uh, it's a little bit different in that the local sheriff's detective is her former, her childhood best friend, who is now uh, uh, the local sheriff's detective. And um, they have a pretty significant rift that gets healed over over the course of the first three books. Uh, it is five full novels and a short story collection. You can see the cover of that over my shoulder. That is called Carried to the Grave and other short stories. Um, it and other stories. It's five contemporary short stories featuring Aaron and the villagers, and then a historical novella that goes back to 1910, when uh, the year that. Uh, Aaron's great grandparents married and opened the mercantile. And in that, we learn that perhaps her sleuthing skills are inherited. Uh, I also write Moody Suspense as Alicia Beckman. The publisher asked me to use a different name to distinguish the suspense novels from the cozy novels, but they are still not super dark or bloody or gory by any means, but uh, they, they, are, they are moody, as I think you can tell by the cover of Blind Faith, the second one, which came out last fall. The first one, Bitterroot Lake, also has a really moody, wonderful cover with a lake and a historic lodge on it. Uh, the name Alicia Beckman honors my mother and grandmother. Um, and I'll just give the short version of Blind Faith if I can remember it. Um, <laughs> I love the book. It really, of, of all my books, it may be, it is certainly one of my favorites, although they're all my favorites in their own way. It's just that uh, there have been a few books since then and a, a few things written since then. It gets a little hard to remember because you're talking about one new book, you're finishing another new book, and then going back and remembering some of the other ones gets a little confusing sometimes. It is a contemporary cold case investigation of a 40-year-old murder in Billings, Montana, where I grew up. And then there's a historic timeline that works its way forward and intersects. And uh, we have multiple point of view characters. I um, borrowed a structure that I had really enjoyed in Laura Lippman's After I'm Gone and in Wicked Girls by Alex Marwood, where that historic storyline works its way forward. And um, that was really challenging and fun to write. You can see over my shoulder my closet doors. They're bifold doors. At one point, I had three rows of sticky notes going down the, the closet doors. I had an outline. I'm a planner. But I needed to be able to see things at a glance. And so I had yellow for the historic and pink for the present and green for the 
newspaper stuff or whatever the colors were. Um, and it helped me keep track of things. Fortunately, I think it's a lot easier for the readers to keep track of things than it was for me. It's I think the glamorous you know, life of a writer. <laughs> you live and it's got this reason. incredible cover. The teddy bear is not part of the cover of the book. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Oh, I am so down for that book. That sounds incredible. Um, so final two questions for you. People are always looking, you know, to established successful authors for some words of advice or guidance. And obviously, you know, you've done quite well for yourself in the world of books, the business of books. I'm looking over your shoulder and I see that Agatha teapot, which I think everybody covets and, you know, wants one. Some people have two or three, you know, who might those people be? Three. Um, but let me ask you, in looking back on a creative life or a writing life more specifically, what do you think is the best advice that you were ever given? And then the flip side of that coin, the best advice that you were never given and actually had to learn for yourself throughout the process of doing the work. Somehow I figured out early, and I'm not sure if I read it or just figured it out, that when you finish the first book and you're querying agents and editors, just keep writing the second one, just keep going. And um, I, as I say, I'm not sure how I figured that out, whether I was given that advice or not. Um, like a lot of, of authors, I've had my challenges in the publishing world, uh, staying published, finding publishers for, for new ventures can sometimes be as difficult as getting published the first time. And the motto I developed, and again, I, I I don't think anybody told me this. I just sort of figured it out. Maybe by seeing that other people whose careers I admired were doing this, it's just find a way. Find a way. I wasn't sure I knew how to find a way. Despite having um, worked in a bookstore, despite having some understanding of contracts in the business. I don't know anybody in publishing. I live in a little town in Northwestern Montana and I had to go out and meet people and I had to go out and learn about things and network. And that is, is the thing that I think is the most important for the, the publishing career, for the business side of things. Uh, stay open and learn from other people. The best advice for the, the creative side is find the stories that you want to tell, that only you can tell. Find the joy in the story. It's going to be difficult some days. There are parts of every day that are difficult. Um, but when you can find the flow, you you will get you will flow. It, it will it will just go. And you're most likely to get there if you try to write the stories that speak to you. And so it might take you a while to figure out what are those most important things? What are, to go back to one of your earlier questions, the passions, the things that really drive you. Um, and it may not be what anybody else you know is writing. That's okay. You can find a way. That's excellent advice. And I think very true. If you're not interested in what you're writing about, you know, it's not gonna sustain you and other people probably won't be so interested as well. Uh, so final question to you, now that I've harassed you about all of the things that you've done, I'm wondering, you know, you've mentioned that, you know, oftentimes you're promoting one book, you're editing a book, and you're also developing or writing a third book. So what can you tell us about what comes next for you? For people who have read everything and can't wait to get their hands on something else, what is that book going to be? Well, I'm delighted to say that there will be at least two more Spice Shop books. The eighth Spice Shop book will be out in July of 2024. It is tentatively titled, To Air is Cumin. And I have to thank a reader for that title. And so if any of you come up with what you think are great spice titles, titles with a, a spice or an herb in them, let me know. I will be most grateful. And of course, you will get a copy of the book and an acknowledgement if I use your title. Uh, and so uh, I'm just wrapping that one up. And then uh, I'm doing a little bit of research for the 2025 book, um, but I'm not gonna say anything about that one yet. I am also working on a collection of historical short stories and novellas 
Uh, some of the stories have been published, some have not, about a real life historical figure here in Montana named Stagecoach Mary Fields, who is just a, a really fascinating figure in, in uh, Montana history. And I've given her uh, uh, a series of mm, crimes and mysteries to, to get involved in. And I don't have a publication date for that, but I think it will be late spring next year. And it will be called All God's Sparrows, which is the name of the first short story I published featuring her. It was in Alfred Hitchcock in um, 2018, and it was the co-winner of the 2018 Agatha Award for Best Short Story. Excellent. I am hooked. So we have much to look forward to. And for some of us, much to look back upon. Um, so as people are awaiting those releases, got to go out and buy the new one. Uh, Between a Walk and a Dead Place, great title, excellent reading. I highly recommend it. Leslie, thank you so much for being here. It was such a pleasure to catch up with you in real time. My pleasure, John. That's it for this episode of Central Booking. Thanks for watching, and be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss a thing.